Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Christy Bear. I'm the Assistant Director of the Center on Finance, Law and Policy. Welcome to our first Blue Bag Lunch Talk of the 2021-22 academic year. These talks were founded the, when the center was founded seven years ago, and the purpose of them is to take advantage of the strength of U of M, where every sidewalk leads to a top 10 program, and allow faculty from different schools to present their ideas and um, before a friendly, supportive, and yet wicked smart and um, super supportive but helpful audience. So. These talks have been happening for a really long time. The topics vary super wild, wildly, widely, either way. And um, these are a chance for you know, faculty to say, to say what they're working on, sometimes before they get to a published paper, sometimes when they just have a working paper. And so I hope that you'll view this as a chance to ask every question that occurs to you. If you read the paper already, fantastic. If you didn't, you don't even need to worry about it because Professor Yimfer is going to tell you all about it and then you can go back and read it after. So our speaker today is Professor Emmanuel Yimfor from the Ross School of Business. He joined the Ross School during COVID and so is meeting people in real life this year. So if you haven't seen him in person in the faculty lounge and you're like, who is that guy? You should go and talk to him because he doesn't know what you look like in 3D. Um, his research is focused on imperial corporate, empirical corporate finance with a focus on financial intermediation, capital formation, entrepreneurial finance. And he's specifically interested in how information frictions affect the ability of startups to raise external financing. He is not teaching this semester. So if you're a student and you were hoping to sign up for his class, you have to wait till next semester. Next semester, though, he's all yours. He's going to be teaching venture capital, private equity, global private equity, and entrepreneurial finance courses next semester. Um, his PhD is from Rice. He has a master's from Kent State. And though he did spend a significant amount of time in Ohio, he is thrilled to be a Michigan Wolverine now. So um, his talk today is, he has a fancy title for it, but we're going to think of it as um, employee misconduct and an investment uh, firm context, because we all want to hear about when employee, employees behave badly. And so he will now tell you what his talk is actually about. He's going to present for a little bit, and at the end, um, everyone will have a chance to just ask questions either in the chat, you can send them to everyone in the chat, or you can raise your hand at the end. And so from here, let me turn it over to Professor Yim Four. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Christy. Um, let me get my slides to full screen mode. Can you see them? All right, excellent. So um, today I'm going to be discussing new work uh, with Heather Tooks. She's at Yale. And in this paper, what we're looking at is the relationship between corporate control transactions and employee behavior. Now, in finance, we're, we're very interested in, in allocating capital to its most productive use. Now, that's no different when it comes to mergers and, and acquisitions. As far as investments go, Mergers are one of the largest investments that a firm would ever make. And so it's very natural that a lot of academic papers have kind of asked the question, are mergers a profitable investment? Now, how have these papers done that? Well, they have looked at various things, right? For issuers, for uh, firms that are publicly traded, they've looked at things like announcement period returns, post takeover stock returns, changes in profitability, but there's really no evidence on the exact precise mechanisms through which the synergies are realized. We're gonna take a different approach and we're gonna get into the weeds here and ask, you know, can, can m a this corporate control transactions, can they improve the behavior of rank and file employees? Now, the investment advisory industry is a very useful laboratory because as I would show you, registration and licensing requires that the information about investment advisory firms, and more specifically, investment advisors be, be public. 
Now, I'm going to talk a lot about employee behavior. I'm going to talk a lot about misconduct. Sometimes I'm going to call them disclosures. Let me give you a little bit of a feel for what these are. So I grabbed an example. So here, the New Jersey Bureau of Securities, here's something that I'll call a regulatory disclosure. The New Jersey Bureau of Securities brought an action against a, a Saviano. I'm going to be calling him an advisor, an investment advisor. And you know, they allege that he engaged in dishonest or unethical behavior uh, uh, in relation to borrowing money from, from his clients, right? And for this, they fined him about $20,000. 20, so here's an example of a regulatory disclosure. Another example maybe is a, is a customer dispute. So here the customer was unhappy with the kind of investments that the advisor purchased for the customer. They complained about it. And this particular dispute ended up being settled for about $45,000. Regulatory actions and customer disputes, those are the most popular categories of disclosures that constitute essentially what I'm gonna also be calling misconduct. And I'll be a little bit more specific about, about why I will be calling some of these disclosures misconduct in a few slides. Now you should know that about 7% of all brokers, so these are individual advisors, employed between 2004 and 2019, have at least one such disclosure. Our paper is not gonna be the first to talk about these disclosures, right? The paper is about corporate control transactions, M&A, and the effect they have on, on these disclosures. But you know, what have people kind of looked at in the past? So you know, this very popular paper, Egan, Magos, and Seru, published in the JPE, showed that you know, this misconduct is widespread. One in 13 advisors has, has a misconduct disclosure. And they show that they are costly. The mean fine, so the fine is like, you know, I showed you a fine for, for the two examples that we looked at earlier. The average fine, if you look at the cross section of these disclosures, is about half a million dollars, and the median settlement is about $40,000. Now, here's a fact that I want, we'll come back to this, but I want you to hold that in your minds for now, okay? One third of these advisors with misconduct are actually repeat offenders. So if I know that you committed misconduct today, there's a very high chance that I know that you're gonna repeat it in the future, given that a lot of these advisors with misconduct are repeat offenders. Now, we also know that misconduct is contagious, right? In a paper by, by Dimo Gherkin and co-authors, what they show is that when advisory firms merge, for example, and a coworker that doesn't have a misconduct record is exposed to a new coworker that has a misconduct record, that employee is more likely to commit misconduct in the next three years. And so the interpretation there is that fraud is contagious, right? And so A, this misconduct events are costly. B, this misconduct events are contagious. If we zoom out a little bit, right? We, we see what is the consequence of this misconduct related disclosures on the investment advisory industry in general? There's a really cool paper by, by Gurun Stoffman and, 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 and Yonker that show that actually these things can be very costly to the investment advisory industry. They use the Bernie Madoff, uh, 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 um, Bernie Madoff, by the way, owned an investment advisory firm. And they looked at how did his clients react when he was revealed as, 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 as being a, a, a fraudster. And they show that a lot of those clients were, 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 were withdrew their assets from investment advisors. So even those that were not directly affected, but those, for example, that knew people who were directly affected, withdrew their money from investment advisors and instead took that money to what they believed was safety to banks. And so we know these disclosures events are, are A, costly, B, contagious, and C, they can have broad reaching impacts on the investment advisory industry in general. And so with, with that at the back of our mind, again, going to our specific question of how do these corporate control transactions affect employee behavior? We're gonna, we're gonna frame our test through the lens of existing theory. What, what do I mean by that? Well, um, when you look back at the theory and the theory kind of suggests which type of targets and acquirers would merge with each other, there's a, there's a broad theory that I titled the market discipline hypothesis, right? That, that suggests that better behaved firms will buy poorly performing firms, right? And there's a lot of empirical support for this idea. So for example, people have found that firms that have high market to book, if you don't know what market to book is, just think about that as better firms, right? Tend to buy firms that have low market to book, maybe poor performing firms, right? And so then uh, uh, I'm gonna get in a second to what this specifically implies 
for, for our specific context, which is mergers in the investment advisory industry and this misconduct related disclosures that we've been, we've been talking about. But just hold that. Market discipline hypothesis, better behaved firms will buy poorly performing firms. Now the complements hypothesis suggests instead that you would have a like bias like in, 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 in mergers and acquisitions. So if two firms maybe have similar cultures, those two firms are more easy to integrate post the merger, merger and it's easy to realize these synergies following the merger. And so you really have two conflicting empirical predictions about who buys whom. Now, what do this hypothesis imply for our context? Again, which is corporate control transactions in the investment advisory industry as a function of employee behavior of either the target or the acquirer. Well, the market discipline hypothesis actually has some pretty specific predictions, right? Number one, we would predict that high misconduct firms will be more likely to be targets and low misconduct firms, the better behaved ones, will be more likely to be acquirers. Two, we would predict in terms of matching that low misconduct acquirers, again, who are better behaved, would match with high misconduct targets. So again, if you're a little bit, what's, if you're squinting, what's the difference between the first and the second? The first one is about who gets to enter the market for mergers and acquisitions. The second one is conditional on entry. How do they match, right? And the third one says, any post-merger reductions in misconduct, to the extent that they are value relevant, right, would be driven by changes related to the target firm employees. Because again, remember, according to the market discipline hypothesis, the target firm employees are not well behaved. And that's one of the reasons why they entered into the, in, into the, the, the M&A market in the first place. What does the complements hypothesis imply? Well, there's no real prediction about who gets to enter the markets for mergers and acquisition because it just suggests that you know, firms with similar culture, firms that are alike, would match with each other. Our main variable of interest here is employee misconduct. So there's a specific prediction about how they match conditional on entry. Targets and acquirers should match according to levels of employee wrongdoing, right? And the complements hypothesis also suggests that if there are any post-merger reductions in misconduct, it could be driven by changes related to the target from employee, the acquiring from employee, or, or maybe even, even both. Let me tell you very briefly about our data. So the, the first data set I kind of briefly discussed, we need the disclosure records of each of these advisors. So we wrote a script to collect that data for about 1.2 million advisors, I believe. The next thing we need, obviously, is, is, is data on mergers. And so we're gonna collect that from a few different sources. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but just so you know, we have 419 mergers in our sample from 2004 to, um, to 2020. Uh, you should also know that the target and the acquirer are US-based investment advisors. All right, now I, I keep talking about employee misconduct. I showed you a specific example. In general, there are about 23 different categories, right? The, the, most, the, the most frequent categories are regulatory disclosures, which I showed you, and, and customer disputes that are, that are settled or awarded some kind of a, a, a judgment. And so you can see here that, you know, we could use all 23 categories of disclosure and call them misconduct. But as Egan, Madlos, and Siru have showed, some of these are not a, a mild disclosures, right? They don't warrant the title of misconduct necessarily. And so they did a lot of the work for us and they separated this, category, this categories of disclosures into ones that are a little bit more severe that would be more related to misconduct. And these are the six categories that I have over here. And so I'm going to really be using two, we are going to be using two measures of, of, of these disclosures at the employee level. The all measure is going to count the total number of these disclosures over the past two years. And the EMS measure, short for Egan, Madvos, and Siru, is going to count just the six categories that are more severe, the more severe categories, essentially, of, of disclosures. I should note that the authors, Egan, Madhus, and Siru, they show that advisors that have committed any one of these other disclosures are also more likely 
to have committed a, a, a misconduct under their more rigorous definitions. So we're gonna interpret changes in either the all measure, which encompasses all the 23 categories, or just the, the more strict categories that Egan, Magnus, and Siru think are more egregious, right, as, as, as misconduct. Now, um, I told you we had 419 mergers here. And so here we're looking at some statistics of targets and acquirers that are in our sample. Now, I don't think it's surprising, <coughs> excuse me. I don't think it's surprising that, you know, on average targets tend to be a lot larger than acquirers. They tend to have a lot more assets under, under management. Right now, related to the hypothesis, one thing that's really interesting here is that you can already kind of see some evidence against the market discipline hypothesis. Right, you can see here that targets are not better behaved necessarily uh, uh, um, uh, relative to acquirers. Set that backwards. Acquirers are not better behaved relative to, to, to targets. You can see that there's almost no difference in the employee disclosures of acquirers and targets. If anything, acquirers have experienced more recent growth in employee disclosures uh, 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 relative to targets. And so this is a, already a little bit of evidence against the market discipline hypothesis of why, of why firms merge. And maybe this kind of suggests the, 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 the complement hypothesis of, of like bias like, but I'm going to do a lot more digging in, in the next few slides. Now, before we get into, okay, who gets to enter the M&A industry as a function of, of, of their misconduct history? How do they match? And is there any drop in misconduct following the merger event? Let me first try to like convince you or just suggest the value relevance of misconduct. And how exactly are we gonna do that? Well, we're, we're gonna do that by looking at the relationship between employee misconduct. Again, remember that this is just, if you have a hundred employees, 10 of them have this misconduct related disclosures in the last two years, for example, right? Then that variable is gonna be 10%. That's exactly how we're measuring misconduct. A unit of observation here is an investment advisor year, right? We're gonna be looking at the cross section of investment advisors. And we're gonna ask if you have more of this employee misconduct, does that predict your level of assets under management, your change in assets under management or whether or not you fail? in the future. And what we find is, if you have this misconduct related disclosures, you have lower future assets on the management. And so here, the estimates imply that a one standard deviation increase in these employee disclosures is associated with 8.3% lower future assets on the management, right? And so again, I'm not making a causal statement here. I'm just trying to convince you by showing you some correlations that misconduct is, is value relevant. If we look at change in assets under management, so here we're looking at the recent change in misconduct and how is that related to future changes in assets under management, we find the same effect. Relative to the unconditional mean here, the estimates here imply that a one standard deviation change in recent employee disclosures is associated with between a 3.5 and a 4.5% decrease in future changes in assets under management. Now, if you're not familiar with the investment advisory industry, you should know that the way most of these advisors, the investment advisory firms earn their revenue is by charging a fraction of assets under management as a fee. So they charge one or 2% of assets under management as a fee. And so assets under management here is very value relevant. The next thing we look at is failures, right? So we say, for example, if you have these recent employee disclosures, are you more likely to fail? And here, again, relative to the unconditional mean, because failure is very rare in the sample, you're anywhere from five to 7% more likely to close if you have more of these uh, employee, employee disclosures. And so this is just to convince you that there is a relationship. Misconduct can be value relevant. Even if you don't believe that misconduct is necessarily causing these variables to change, at the very least, Misconduct is associated with something that's value relevant. And to the extent that that's true, maybe it is a variable that potential acquirers will focus on when they're doing the merger, okay? And so the next thing we're gonna look at is the first test that I showed you when we were talking about the hypothesis, which is who gets to enter the investment advisory market as a function of their, of their misconduct history. 
Now, again, remember that the market discipline hypothesis would predict that if you're an acquirer and you have a high level of employee disclosures, you're more like if, if you're a target, you're more likely to have a high level of misconduct related disclosures. Your employees are not well behaved. And that's why people are trying to take you over so that they can realize the synergies by improving the behavior of your employees. On the other hand, the market discipline hypothesis would predict that as an acquirer, you're going to be, have better behaved employees. And as such, your misconduct related disclosure should be low. What do we find? Well, we, we don't find evidence that's consistent with the market discipline hypothesis. Here, the estimates imply that if you have a one standard deviation increase in employee disclosures relative to the unconditional mean, you're about 12% less likely to be a target for, for, for an acquisition, again, which is not consistent with the market discipline hypothesis. We expect the signs to be the opposite of what they are. When we look at the target, the relationship is the same, although when we do put control variables, it's not as significant. And so here, when we're looking at entry into the, into the market for M&As, what we conclude really is that the evidence is not consistent with the, with the market discipline hypothesis, right? It, it seems to point more towards potential complementarities in misconduct, especially if you group this with the statistics that I showed you at the start there. What we just looked at, what does employee disclosures for the target look like? What do employee disclosures for the acquirer look like? They didn't seem to be that different from each other. If anything, targets seem to have recent growth in, in employee disclosures. And so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna test for assertative matching on, on this employee disclosures. Is it true that we really have a like bias like world where firms with high levels of employee disclosure are more likely to match with other firms with the same level of employee disclosures. Now, how are we gonna do that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through it because you know, the, it, it could be counterintuitive when you first hear about it. So what we're doing now is, is there matching on, on employee misconduct in, in M&A? Now to do that, let's start with a, with a very simple example. So here are two, here are two mergers in our sample in, in 2015. So Washington acquired Halsey and Pinnacle acquired uh, um, Enrichment. Now, how are we gonna do the, the counterfactual mergers? In an ideal world, <laughs> we would like to see all the targets that Washington considered, right? We would like to see all the targets that Pinnacle considered. And we would ask, how does Halsey differ, for example, from all the other targets that Washington considered? Well, we're empiricists and we don't observe that counterfactual. So we're gonna, approximated by doing the following. We're gonna take Halsey and we're gonna pair Halsey with Washington and Pinnacle. We'll do the same thing for enrichment. And so two of these mergers actually happened and two of them did not. Now we can observe employee disclosures for Halsey and for all the firms here. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create four buckets. We're gonna create, our first bucket is where the acquirer and the target both have this misconduct related disclosures. The second bucket, uh, the target has misconduct related disclosures, but the acquirer doesn't. The third bucket, neither of them do. And the fourth bucket, only the target has this misconduct related disclosures. And we're gonna ask in each of these buckets, what fraction of these firms are actually true merging pairs to test for evidence of matching on misconduct? So here's what that figure looks like. So again, recall that here, for example, this tall bar would be the acquirer has some type of disclosure and the target has some type of disclosure. And so we see here that 4.15% of all pairs in this bucket are true merging firms. When we create this counterfactual pairs, the unconditional merger rate is about 2.25%. So this is 83% larger. And so when we look at target and acquirer pairs with no disclosure, we also see that that's higher. And so the evidence here does seem to suggest matching on misconduct. We could, we could be a little bit more rigorous. How? We could actually run a regression where we can hold different things fixed. So I showed you the, 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 the counterfactual pairing, right? Some of them are, are, are fake mergers, others are real. What we're gonna ask is, is if the distance in disclosure between the acquirer and the target is high, right? And we have assertative matching on misconduct, then we would expect that to be negatively related 
to the probability of a merger? What kind of whole other characteristics of the target and acquirer fits? So how, how should you interpret retail clients here, for example? Retail clients would be an indicator that equals one if both the target and the acquirer both serve retail clients. We're gonna do the same thing for the other control variables. Now, what we find there again is evidence of assertive matching and misconduct. So here, a standard deviation increase, for example, in the distance in employee disclosures between the acquirer and the target relative to the unconditional mean here is associated with about a 20% decrease in the probability of a merger, which does support the like bias like hypothesis, the complement hypothesis of mergers in the investment advisory industry. Now, the next thing we're gonna to move to is, does misconduct drop following the merger? Is there evidence, what we're gonna be calling, is there evidence of misconduct synergies? And this misconduct synergies, I should come back to this again and recall that I have shown you some suggestive evidence that this misconduct related disclosures are value relevant, right? If you had higher levels of employee misconduct, you are more likely to close, which is costly, not just to the firm, but to the firm's clients. If you had a higher level, of employee disclosures, your future assets under management were likely to be low, and even the change in assets under management as a function of a change in employee misconduct, those things were, were negatively related. And so does misconduct drop following the merger? Now, before I show you, you know, the, 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 our, our finding, I want to set the stage a little bit by showing you a little bit of the detail. So remember Halsey and Washington from earlier, right? They merged in 2015. Now to, to, to conduct this test, we're gonna assume, for example, that they merged in, in 2012, right? And then we're gonna track the merger all the way to 2018. So three years before the merger, three years after the merger. Of course, we can observe the disclosure for, for, for Halsey up until the merger when it gets absorbed by Washington. We can observe the disclosures for Washington. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna say, what is the weighted average of employee misconduct for the target and the acquirer, say, in 2012? And this is my simple example here. They had an equal number of employees, so the average is going to be 1.5. Obviously, after the merger, we're just going to be tracking the combined firm here, and so the target is now going to have a value for, for, for disclosures. If you have questions about this, we can always get back to it. And so what do we find? Well, we find a drop in misconduct following the merger by anywhere from 25 to 34%, depending on the measure of, of, of misconduct that you use. There's also a decline in the growth of recent misconduct uh, uh, following the merger. And in the paper, we, we, do, we, we do a lot of gymnastics, essentially, to make sure that this, this result is robust. And so if you have some questions about that, we can come back to it, or you can take a, a look on my, uh, at, at, at the paper, which is, I believe, posted on my website. Now, misconduct falls following the merger. Is that an, artif some, an artifact of, of, of the way we constructed the sample? You know, in order to find out whether the drop in misconduct is actually as a result of the merger, we need to go after the mechanism. Why does misconduct essentially fall following the merger? All right, now there are a few reasons why misconduct might fall following the merger, right? It, it could be the case that existing employees of the combined target and acquiring firm suddenly start to behave better. Hey, after the merger, I met this other guy who turns out does something that's very similar to me. Lunch was all nice and fun, but they might lay me off and keep him instead. I better get my act together. And so everybody starts behaving better. Or it could be the case that after the merger, uh, 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 the, the, the combined firm, they let go suddenly of a lot of employees that have this misconduct related disclosures. And so we're gonna call that the separation hypothesis. And that's what we're gonna test next. So here in this set, new set of tests, a unit of observation is gonna be an employee, an individual advisor working for either the target or the acquirer in the five years before the merger, right? We're gonna simply ask if you have misconduct related disclosures, recent instances of misconduct, right? Are you more likely to get fired after the merger? So post is going to be an indicator equals one for the years following the merger. And so what we find is, indeed, you are more likely to be fired following the merger. If we look, so here is, is, are the results for, for target firm employees only. If we look, for example, at the sensitivity of these disclosures to separation 
before the merger happened, we see that they're not statistically significant. But certainly after the merger happens, employees with these disclosures are more likely to be, to be fired irrespective of the measure of misconduct that, that we use. Now, one, one way to interpret this result is, you know, the target firm manager, for example, had maybe close relationships with some of these employees. He thought maybe they should be let go, but he was bearing significant costs if he let them go. Maybe there might be backlash against him. A new manager has no such problems and he can easily let these employees go. And so you would imagine intuitively that this sensitivity to separations as a function of disclosures would be more severe ex ante for acquirers that are more sensitive to, to these disclosures. So for example, if, if, if Christie, right, if Christie were, were, were an acquirer and it turns out that, you know, before she acquired the Emmanuel firm, she has a habit of letting go of employees that have these disclosures because she knows that it's costly. It is easy to imagine that after she acquires Emmanuel, she's gonna implement the same thing. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to get a sense of how strict Christie is before the merger. And to do so, we're gonna run this test at the individual acquirer level. So we're gonna use the cross-section of employees that work for a given acquirer A and estimate this beta one coefficient, how sensitive is Christy, in my simple example here, to employee misconduct related disclosures. We're gonna sort acquirers and say, do those acquirers that seem to be more sensitive, are they the ones who are more, for lack of a better word, trigger happy, more happy to let go of employees with this misconduct related disclosures after the merger? And that's exactly what we find, right? So like HSD, there's like high separation for disclosures there, that beta coefficient, when it's higher, those acquirers are more likely to separate with, with their employees. And so we'll find evidence consistent with stricter disciplining mechanisms after the merger leading to these to this separations after the merger. Now, I, I laid out two possible mechanisms through which uh, 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 misconduct could drop following the merger. One was employee separations. The other, if you remember, were existing employees behaving better. And so I've shown you results for separation here. And so how much do separations contribute to the drop that we showed earlier, right? We showed a drop from anywhere from 25 to 34%, depending on the merger, on, on, the, on, the, on the measure of misconduct. Is, is zero, for example, the right benchmark of the contribution of separation to that drop? Well, to like get a sense of just how much the separation contributes to that drop, we're gonna do what I, I think is a pretty interesting exercise. So, um, so let's, I'm gonna come back, come back to that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, look, let's, let's look at the employees that either work for the target or acquiring firm and let's track them as before, right? What fraction of employees have a new instance of this misconduct related disclosure? And we track the fraction from negative three before the merger to three years following the merger. Now we're gonna do a counterfactual exercise. We're gonna say, okay, now we know that you let Aaron go. We know that you fired him at, 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 at T equals zero in the year of the merger. But let's assume you did not fire him. Let's assume that you had kept him. If you had kept him and all the other employees that you had, you, you let go, what would your misconduct have looked like, right? Let's bring back those separated employees did not just vanish into thin air. A lot of them got jobs at other firms. So let's keep them back and assign their misconduct to the merged firm and see what misconduct would have looked like. And what we find is, if anything, you would have observed an increase in misconduct following the merger if you had kept the employees that you separated with. And so this leads us to believe that most, if not all, of the drop in misconduct following the merger is really through this channel of employee separations. Now, the thing that I skipped over before is really to show you that a lot of the separations are really ha happening for target firm employees, not necessarily for acquiring firm employees. Remember the earlier figure I showed you showed that most of the drop came in, in, the, first, in the first year after the merger. And so let's just zoom in in the months to the merger and look at the probability of separation here separately for acquiring firm employees and for target firm employees. You can see for acquiring firm employees, there's almost no change after the merger, but for target firm employees, you can see a huge spike in the probability of separation, especially for employees that have this misconduct related disclosures. And so, you know, we, we conclude that these corporate control transactions 
can discipline the labor force, right? Employee misconduct declines by anywhere from 25 to 34% following the merger, and it's driven by separations, especially by acquiring from employees that are sensitive to these disclosures. Employees at the target have, have better misconduct record. However, the sensitivity to separation increases following the merger, again, consistent with improved disciplinary mechanisms. Now, contrary to the, to the, to the market discipline hypothesis, our evidence really is, is more consistent with the complement hypothesis of, of like buying, of, of like buying like, right? And it's interesting to know that MA can, can, can be disciplinary even in the world in which like is buying like. Remember, I said there was no specific prediction about the complement hypothesis on employee behavior following corporate control transactions. And so, even though the complement hypothesis describes our evidence of matching and entry into the market for mergers, it is nice to know that you know, m and can improve behavior even, even in the world in which, in which like buys like. Thank you very much. Terrific. Um, who wants, do we want to, uh, who wants to kick us off with questions? Oh, I can see you're talking, Professor Pritchard, but you're not, I can't hear you. I was trying to figure out how to raise my hand. I've succeeded now. We're a year and a half into Zoom and I know how to work it. So uh, my uh, background with regard to this is from the broker dealer industry rather than uh, investment advisor industry. But I think that, that there are a lot of similarities between the, the two fields and uh, the when you were explaining the market discipline hypothesis, uh, it, uh, it, it's not your hypothesis, it's out there, but it didn't make any sense to me because uh, I understood from the broker deal industry that uh, the way you deal with employee misconduct is through firing, right? And there are differences among firms in their willingness to fire uh, overall, I would say big firms are more willing to fire than small firms, and uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to acquire a firm and improve it by firing the advisors because you're buying a firm and then losing a bunch of assets under management because a lot of those accounts will leave when you fire them. So uh, I wonder how much of the effect you have from mergers uh, creating greater sensitivity. If a firm grew through organic growth, right, to a larger size and had a more intrusive compliance program because larger firms have more rigorous compliance controls, would you see a similar increase in sensitivity to employee misconduct, right? Uh, because if uh, my intuition is the, the way you deter employee misconduct is by firing and you vary on that basis based on whether or not you've detected it and bigger firms can afford better internal controls. So I'm not sure what my question is, that's my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more of a point. I was like, I didn't get a question out of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, is there a way of comparing your merged firms to firms that grew organically? So, um, one one thing that we do in the paper that I did not present here today is we do a matching exercise when we're looking at the drop in in in, in employee misconduct following the merger. So what we do is we say, let's take another, another firm, say an investment advisory firm that was not in the market for M&A. And let's look at a firm that was in the same state, maybe had a similar level of this employee uh, 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 misconduct and we match on three other variables. Now let's do things, the same thing for the acquirer. So we're creating essentially a pseudo merger here. Let's find an advisory firm that was not in the market at all, but that looks very similar to the acquirer. Now that we have this our pseudo merge firms, let's track their misconduct history alongside our merge firm. And what we find is that 
there is really no change in, in the pseudo merge in misconduct in the pseudo merge merger pair. And the change really seems to come from the, the actual merge pair, if that makes any sense. So we do we do this matching exercise where we try to find you know, a similar potential target, similar potential acquirer that should be just as large as, as the combined merge firm. And we don't we don't find any change in disclosures there. But but it's not as large, so they haven't had the change in internal controls, is my point. Oh, in the in this counterfactual exercise, your, your pseudo merged firm is not actually merged. There were no changes in the compliance department, right? And and the changes in the compliance department—that's our main point, right? Like when you, when you have these two merged firms and there's changes in compliance, then suddenly you have this drop in employee misconduct. And against the backdrop of previous literature, if you read the pre the prior literature, you, you would you would get the sense that disclosures really go unpunished. Like the Egan paper, for example, says half of these advisors just get jobs with other firms, right? And so it doesn't, you don't get the sense that there's some disciplinary mechanism through which these this disclosures get enforced. Even if you fire them, they can just find a job someplace else. And so when you look at these corporate control transactions, we come in and say, look, these corporate control transactions really impose this discipline in a big way rather than just like firing of, of employees at different firms. Professor Amin. Hi, it was a very interesting uh, presentation. So just speaking back on the internal uh, control uh, improvements, one thing you might want to explore is internal whistleblowing or the uh, um, information that uh, um, sometimes the employees, they uh, pass it to OSHA or other places that there has been um, financial misconduct, or there has been some other thing. So those are some reported um, uh, documentation that could also lead to some litigation. So maybe uh, one of the channels that you were talking about the separation, uh, whether that leads to an improvement in compliance or not, you can uh, use uh, this internal whistleblowing as a complementary data to uh, further strengthen the argument, maybe if that's uh, any help, it does any help to your to your um, channel that that you might want to explore. Thank you, Abu. That's not something that we have thought about. We certainly certainly look into that. I made a note of that. Thank you. Professor Yimport, this is probably a dumb question, but my job is to make everybody else feel better about how much they know. So um, I don't, I'm not familiar with m a generally, um, but I don't know, I'm curious, like when I assume that there are dozens of factors that acquirers are looking at when they're looking to acquire somebody and that this employee misconduct is just one small factor um, out of dozens. And so I'm just wondering, like, how big is this? If you could provide me, if, yeah, like how big of a factor is this? Five to 7% sounds like it could be a lot when you're talking about millions or billions of dollars, but I don't know um, if there are other bigger factors that I don't, I don't have a sense of how big that is as compared to the other factors that acquirers might be considering. That's actually an excellent question. So in the, in the paper, we to motivate essentially our focus on, on misconduct, we do two things. The first one is talk about its potential value relevance by showing that you know, these are some variables that this advisory firms would care about, like failures, levels of assets under management. But in generally, more specifically, your question is about, hey, look, I'm looking, if Christy is looking to buy the Emmanuel firm, what are some of the top things that she considers? And so we, we, we read an industry report that suggested that 30% of these transactions fail because the, 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 the acquiring firm didn't think the culture would be compatible, right? And so when you think about what, what the culture is, right? That, that is very related to this, because so there might be some firms that might be more tolerant. Maybe that's just their culture. They think you should be aggressive at all costs, even if you incur some of these disclosures. And there might be other firms that don't, don't think that way. They think, you know, maybe it's, it's a negative, uh, uh, it's not good publicity when we have so many of these disclosures. And so uh, uh, the, the, the culture, the, the, the culture, firm culture as a reason for merger, they really, again, led us to believe that misconduct is really relevant, 
not just in M and A, but but for value in general. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else want to chime in? It's okay. I thought he explained it really well too. So if you all feel like you got it, you know. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Can we have a moment to acknowledge Professor Yim for, for his talk today? Either with your virtual icons or you can turn on your camera and clap. Oh, I like it. The little party signs. Um, thank you so much for participating today, for joining us. Um, please come back next month. I do. I uh, I do have one little promo because you know we are in the business of um, promoting side projects, um, which is I'm hiring. So most the center has about 20 research assistants from five schools who work with us each semester. Um, we lost a huge more than half of our group last year to graduation. And so I am still hiring two law students and I'm still hiring a Ross MBA or possibly PhD student to work on some projects. The postings are listed there. Um, if you know some students who would be fantastic, um, please have them hurry up and apply because I'm starting to get nervous. So, um, Thanks, thanks again for that. And I hope that you will uh, join us again at a future talk. And with that, we will return to all of you 11 minutes of your time. So thanks everyone. And Professor Yim, if you don't mind to hold on a second, I wanted to ask you about something else. All right. Jeremy, will you stay too? Emmanuel, I just want to say thank you for, for being here and apologize for not being there for most of the talk. I had a, a conflict earlier, um, so sorry to miss. You know, it's tough when you only jump in for q and <laughs> I mean, it made the talk sound very interesting, makes me interested in wanting to find out more about the project, so I'm sorry to, to have missed it. But uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I don't think we met in person, but I'm, you know, at Ross as well. I'm co-faculty director of the, the center. Uh, right. So I'll look forward to having you involved in, in more center projects as we go forward. All right.